Yeah. Are we ready? We good? All right, we're live. We are uh, doing something new here at Southside. We're all adjusting to our new normal. So we are so glad that uh, hopefully you've joined us um, and uh, maybe all this technology is working and we appreciate all the folks behind the scenes who are helping us adjust to a new way to do church because uh, clearly we are um, we're adjusting as we go. But we wanted to do something tonight um, on this Wednesday night of this first week of, uh, of this new reality that we're all living in and just try to help inform everybody about what's going on uh, with uh, the coronavirus and what you can do to protect yourself and your families, um, give you some advice and directions as well as to keep you posted on what is happening uh, at Southside Baptist Church, the way we are uh, continuing to support and minister to families right here in the Jacksonville area and how you might partner with us to do that. And uh, if maybe if you're somebody or somebody you love who needs some help, we uh, certainly want to make ourselves avail available uh, for that too. So I've got with me today my good friend, Dr. Fahim Gerges. And uh, Dr. Gerges, is a, 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 we're happy to have you. You are, uh, you work in a local ER and I, and I, but you said you haven't been in it for a while, so. so yeah. So I was on spring break last week. Okay. So I think it's okay to be here. And, well, uh, these are clean scrubs. These are okay. Well, I was just saying because I know that we are uh, probably a little closer than the CDC mandate is supposed to be. So that's right. It's okay though, and everybody at home watching online, they they're keeping safe social distance. So why don't we just start, Fahim? Tell us a little bit about COVID nineteen, coronavirus. I mean, those two words they, they get used a lot interchangeably yeah. i'm assuming we're all talking about the same thing but give us just sort of a a layman's description of what we're talking about here and why this is such a big deal that we have basically shut down the world okay uh, yeah. Ab absolutely so i think um you know when you think about something that's going to cause a pandemic um the coronavirus is something that isn't normally in humans um if you look at influenza as a good example influenza comes in seasons right so when you think about that, usually we have some immunity to a seasonal influenza virus. Um, the times where you see influenza get really bad is when uh, it comes from an animal, and that will cause pandemic influenza, which is something that our bodies haven't seen before. And that's what's happening and now. That is what's happening now. So coronavirus uh, lives in a bat reservoir traditionally, and if you look at what happened with SARS and MERS, those were previous pretty bad viruses that caused um, epidemics out in Asia and the Middle East. Um, SARS and, and MERS um, both came from animals. MERS came from a camel. Um, and, you know, they, they eventually mutated over and in, infected humans. So coronavirus is the same thing. They actually think it came from the pangolin, um, which actually those, are, those animals are passed around quite a bit in overseas. Um, and, and then it mutated and, and managed to get its way into humans. So the reason it's become such a problem is because we don't have any immunity to it at all from previous exposure. This is the first time. So that's why when you hear novel coronavirus, it's completely novel. In other words, our immune system can't recognize it. Okay. And so uh, the fact that it has spread around the world so fast, obviously there are thresholds for pandemic. What does – sort of what's that threshold is it when it reaches every continent or i mean how how, how does something go from being an epidemic to being a pandemic yeah pandemic is really like and i have to i forget the technical definition but it's really when it affects everyone okay right? and where you know that based on kind of the rate of exposure that it's going to continue to spread at a pretty pretty significant rate so i think i mentioned this number before but if you look at influenza it spreads about one to one one person gets it, they spread it to one other person. Um, so the, the, in this case, COVID-19 or, or the SARS-N covirus 2, which is what the name of the virus is, um, it ha it's about a one to two. Okay. So, so for every person that gets it, they spread it to two others, which is why if you pay attention to the numbers across the world, you'll see a, you know, a doubling every couple days. Okay. Um, even in Florida, if you look at a couple of days ago, there were 100 cases, now there's over 200. So, and also taking into account the fact that it takes a while to get testing back, that we weren't testing a lot of people in Florida, all of those things affect what those numbers look like. But you can tell by the rate of spread that it's truly a pandemic. So it, ta tell us a little bit about the, the disease itself and how it affects somebody that is infected. What does it, what does it look like to have the coronavirus? Yeah. Um, if, if you, I mean, I know there are some symptoms, but obviously a lot of those symptoms look a lot like 
cold and flu symptoms from what I'm hearing. How do you know that, you, that, that you how do you, how, when you should, should you begin worrying that this isn't just a cold or seasonal allergies, this is something more? Yeah, so um, I think when you wanna, if you wanna differentiate it from the flu, um, and the flu causes, you know, body aches, fevers, um, pretty bad cough, and sometimes a little bit of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, I think the thing that makes uh, COVID-19 uh, different is really shortness of breath, um, as well as chest pain, and then severe malaise, meaning I just can't get up and do anything. I do not have any energy. I'm just sapped of all my energy. Um, so <clears throat> when you look at COVID-19 uh, patients, that's, that, those two things are the bigger ones. But the other thing, I mean, it does have the cough, and it does have pretty high to moderate fevers associated with it as well. But I would say the shortness of breath and the malaise um, are the things that kind of distinguish it from flu. So would you say if somebody or somebody that we love mm -hmm. is beginning to show those symptoms, what would you recommend they do? Because I know, you know, part of it right now is the ER, the emergency rooms, healthcare facilities can be overrun. And if you go there and you don't have it, you could contract yeah. it there. So at what point would you say, hey, you should probably make your way to the ER or contact? I mean, we obviously you can call a doctor before you go see them, but when would you say, hey, it's probably time to pack it up and go? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, you know, there's high-risk groups, right? Um, and the high-risk groups are mostly people who have uh, things like lung disease, heart disease, and diabetes, and those are the things that are higher risk. And then also by age. So anybody that's older, over uh, 65 years old, is probably the higher risk group as well by age. And so those are the people I would be more concerned about. In terms of symptoms, if you develop shortness of breath, right, you're having difficulty breathing, um, that's probably the big thing that would make me want somebody to get evaluated. And if that gets to a point where um, it's, it's pretty significant for you, then what you'd want to do is call 911, but you'd want to give them a heads up about what you're worried about. Okay. Say, I think I may have COVID-19, I'm short of breath, and I need an ambulance to come get here. If they come to your house, if you have a mask on, that's better because infecting the EMS providers who are going to be going from house to house, picking people up and helping people, they don't want to do that either. So they'll probably have masks on, but that's why I would say give them a heads up. Got it. Okay, that's good. Uh, talk a little bit, if you, if you would, about um, – so we're hearing different reports about the the disease, the death rate, and I know we don't necessarily know because we don't really know who all is infected. I mean, the, the, as you said, the testing hasn't been addressed. But what is it looking like in terms of the mortality rate for the people who are being diagnosed with COVID-19? Yeah, so I think that's pretty variable depending on the numbers that you look at. So the numbers that we, you know, I think I did a calculation today, and it looked like the worldwide mortality was 4% for all of the confirmed cases, 4%. Um, so, so what's the normal flu? Normal flu is 0.1%. Okay. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. That said, <clears throat> there, are, there is significant underreporting. So meaning there's a lot of people who have it who probably haven't been tested for it because if you look at um, what it's doing to our ability to test, uh, places nationwide are running out of test kits. They're running out of some of the supplies. So, what has happened is uh, I think Trump actually issued a thing to basically have uh, coordination between private laboratories and the federal government to increase testing. So testing will increase, but I think up until now, the numbers we've seen have been skewed towards the people that we really think have it. So there are probably a lot of people who have it but haven't been tested and confirmed for it. And so that might bring the mortality down significantly. Uh, yeah. And so let's talk, talk a minute about that because yeah. one of the things I'm hearing is that there are is a really strong possibility that you can have uh, COVID-19 and be asymptomatic and not even know you're carrying it and spreading it. You go visit your grandma and, you know, you're not, you're not going to the nursing home now, but you go visit grandma at her house and, uh, you know, you're in your 20s and you don't feel bad at all, but you can actually take it to grandma when you go see her and not even know that you, were, you yourself were carrying. Is that true? Is that right? That's right. So I think um, if you look at the CDC recommendation for people who have been in high risk areas, places like China, South Korea, Italy, um, and coming back, you should self quarantine for, for 14 days. So where does that number come from? The number, <coughs> excuse me, the number comes from the fact that most people will develop symptoms within five days of exposure. Even five days is not really that fast, right? right. But there have been cases that have, that have presented 15 or 16 days after the exposure. And so that's where CDC basically said, we're gonna choose 14 days as a safe time to quarantine. 
self quarantine okay. to make sure that if you uh, don't have symptoms within 14 days, you're probably okay. And so, yes, there are patients who will, people who will walk around and really not have much disease. There are pa people who will get it and have very mild symptoms. Um, so not everybody gets a bad case of it. And if you look at, you know, younger folks, people, um, you know, people that are under that age group who don't have a lot of chronic diseases, it's going to be a lot like the flu. Um, and it may be a little bit more severe in some ways, and some of them will get sick. Um, but but I will say, you know, that's that's probably the biggest thing is, is um, I think, you know, most people will develop a mild case of it. Um, so all the directives to sort of just hunker down, social distancing, really, it, it's not you can even if you're feeling fine and, and you, you don't suspect anything. I mean, if, it's just probably better for everybody to to keep that distance and stay home if you can work from home, work remotely, I'm guessing. Yeah, because if you figure out how contagious it is, right, um, that's that's really the problem, right? So the social distancing thing is a real thing because we're trying to keep this from getting out of control at a rate that will overwhelm the system, right? right? I mean, and also, you know, just to keep limit the number of people who get really sick with it. Um, let's talk a little bit about what families can do, what individuals can do to uh, protect themselves, protect their families. You know, you, you've got young kids. Uh, I've got teenagers. Um the school systems look like it's going to be closed down a little bit longer, uh, which I'm guessing will help in some ways and make it really challenging in others for some families. But talk a little bit about what you would recommend to families. Uh, I mean, you just got to go to the grocery store. You got to, you know, you, you, there are things that we still have to do to continue to live. Uh, how can families really protect themselves and their loved ones uh, during this during this peak time? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you don't want to be in confined spaces with a large group of people for a long period of time. And when I say long period of time, more than, you know, a certain amount of time. You, I think probably, you know, 10, 20 minutes in a, so like things like, you know, we're in a church, that was part of the thing, right? right? Being in a confined space with a lot of people um, is the concern, concerts, uh, restaurants. I think there was a recent mandate that said restaurants over 50, with over 50 occupancy, couldn't have that much. They had to have it or something like that. So there's something coming down from the governor today about that. So um, anywhere where you're confined in a space with a lot of people for a prolonged period of time is going to risk put you at risk of exposure. When you look at the distance from ha from get, getting it from uh, from an infected person, it's about six feet. So you want to give yourself about a six-foot distance from, from somebody nearby you who might have it or other people. So that's what the whole social distancing thing is. Um, you got to live your life, right? So I would say just being reasonable. There's no reason you can't go to the store, but I might be smart about it and go first thing in the morning. Um, I think I told you this the other day. I told my parents, you know, they're older. I said, um, you know, go to the store at 7 in the morning, you know, when there's not people there. And most stores are taking measures to disinfect in the evenings. So if you look at, I know Publix put a thing out there. They said, we're disinfecting our store after 8 o'clock. That's why we're closing early. So if you go first thing in the morning, there's less people. Everything's clean. Get in, get out, um, and minimize your exposure that way. What about, um, would you suggest, for example, senior adults? I mean, curbside delivery or pickup or, I mean, curbside pickup delivery, those kind of things, is that helpful or better if people can do that? Or if they've got a younger, you know, a, if they've got a son or grandson, granddaughter living in town, pick the groceries up for them. Does that, does that help or is that in some way more problematic? I mean, I think it's okay as long as that person's not at high risk right. themselves, right? So I wouldn't want that person being a, you know, vector to the, to the older relative. But I think, um, you know, I think in general, you're limiting your exposure. So that makes sense to me. Okay. Well, we are so glad everybody's joining us um, for this uh, Facebook Live event. And we want to take some questions online. And we've got some already coming in at, for you. Uh, so one coming from Casey, can the virus be passed strictly via surfaces that are high touch? Or could it also be something someone touched once or twice, like a plastic grocery bag, piece of mail, et cetera? Yeah, so um, definitely high-touch surfaces are um, a risk. Uh, the virus can live probably for about a day on things like doorknobs, keyboards, things like that. If, particularly if you've got somebody that's sick in your house and you think might have it, um, you want to clean those high-touch surfaces um, you know, daily with Lysol or something that has some bleach in it or um, more than 70% alcohol in it. Um, so those definitely can transmit the virus. Um, as, in terms of somebody transmitting something once, I would say – it's pretty unlikely. You'd have to have a, a lot of a lot of virus, or somebody sneezed right on something, 
if they just handled it once and you know what I mean so it's possible um, I wouldn't get crazy paranoid about it but I would say particularly if somebody's infected around you that is living with you or you know you want to close that person off in their own room they should be wearing a mask you should be cleaning a lot of surfaces around the house to make sure everything's disinfected okay cool uh, another question where can we acquire a mask now that's an interesting question because I've also heard some people say that's not necessarily helpful. Uh, so there's been some conflicting news reports about the value of a mask. So I guess the question, first of all, is do you recommend them and how helpful would they be if you're out and about? And second of all, where do you get them? <laughs> I think that may, may yeah. be a question a lot of people. So have. I don't know where you get them because I don't think anybody can really find them right now, to be honest. So yeah. if you find them, you email me. But <laughs> um, <laughs> what, I, what I would say is um, – you know, they probably provide some protection. You okay. know, they probably provide some protection. Where they provide you protection is if you encounter a sick person who's sneezing or coughing. Um, and and really, if you look at how the virus gets transmitted, it's by droplet. Um, in some very rare cases, I think there's a little controversy over whether or not it's truly airborne, but but really, I don't think that's the case. Um, so, when it, and when I say droplet, it means droplets from a cough or a sneeze getting on your mouth or your mucous membranes or uh, in your eyes, which drain back into your throat. So um, that's that's how you can get it. So I do think a mask probably would limit it. I think if you're if you're not outside for a long period of time and you're not around sick people, there's probably no point. Right. But but if you're going to be, I mean, for example, health care workers um, working in areas where you could have people who are coughing and sneezing and we don't know if they have them, then that's a higher risk yeah. for sure. So somebody asked specifically about um, cloth face masks. Like if, I mean, obviously, is, is anything that's covering your face or is it a particular material that would be more helpful? Yeah, I think I think that's probably as effective. I would just make sure that when they get soiled, they get cleaned properly. Okay. Um, but anything that covers your mucous membranes is going to protect you probably in some way. So I just thought about this. Uh, you wear glasses. I sometimes wear glasses. Would wearing glasses normally just because it's going to keep things from you know getting to your eye? Um, a little bit, I would say. You know, these aren't that great because they don't protect the sides, you around yeah. the sides. Um, when you look at eye protection, and this is more kind of in the healthcare world, right. you need things that that mask your face. So um, this may provide you a little bit, but not much. So let me before we'll take some more questions. And again, if you are joining us, we're so glad you're here, uh, Southside Baptist Church. Uh, Facebook Live event, just talking to Dr. Fahim Gurgis, and uh, please go ahead and submit your questions, and we will make sure we ask them uh, to Dr. Gurgis, um, and again, thank you for, for being here. Uh, talk talk a little bit, you, you know, I, I've known you and your family a long time, uh, you know, a lot of folks in our church, uh, very connected to one another, and there are a lot of healthcare workers in our church. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is, I mean, I would think you guys would be, on, I mean, you are, you're on the front line of this. Um, I mean, we want to know how to pray for you, but also I guess we want some sense of what beyond that can we do to support you guys during this time because I just cannot imagine, you know, you've got, like I said, young kids at home and family and, you know, what, like, how is the Gerges family going to handle this when you're back in the ER here in a few days? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it's just part of the job, right? So uh, I think we just have to be smart about it. I know for me personally, um, one of the recommendations has come down is to have extra pairs of clothes so that I'm not bringing anything home, changing at work, putting those in a bag, changing on my way home, changing the garage before I get inside the house. I'm just going to try to be smart about it um, and wear the proper protection. And as far as you all can help me, prayers is probably, probably I think, the best thing. And I think my family would definitely appreciate that. And um, I don't know. I think, I mean, there's plenty of workers, so it's, there's plenty of people doing this kind of work, so I wouldn't say it's anything you know, specific to us. Well, I think those of us who aren't think it is because yeah. <laughs> it is definitely – we definitely appreciate you all year long, but a time like this comes, we really recognize the, the importance of it. Um, so a couple other questions that have come in. I've heard that people with chronic issues such as MS or lupus, et cetera, are at a higher risk. Is that true? You know, I've not seen anything that specifically says that. Um, I think where some risk potentially comes in with those populations would be on people on uh, steroids and things like that that suppress the immune system. So, so any steroid, if you're on a steroid for anything, that's going to put you at a higher risk? Yeah, anything that you take um, by mouth, okay. not like a topical steroid. But, um, you know, I think those will probably place patients at, at greater risk. And obviously immunosuppressed patients 
transplant patients, anybody who's on any sort of immunosuppressant drug would be in that category as well. Is that, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. What about folks who are, I mean, maybe they've just, uh, uh, they've, they've been through chemotherapy or they're in chemotherapy. Is that a uh, category that should be? Yeah, I would be concerned. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, in, and this isn't to scare anyone, but the, the concern there is really just, you know, self-isolate. Yeah. Right? So, you know, really, you know, you really do. That is the kind of person who should have groceries delivered or stuff brought to them and, and just hang out and, and hang low until this kind of passes over. So, and that's, that really leads to something I wanted to say as far as the church and our response to this, because we are mobilizing our deacon body, uh, mobilizing our members. Many of you have even emailed in or texted and said, Hey, we're available to help any way we can. If you or someone you love, someone you know, describe, it fits the description um, that Fahim has given us of somebody who really should practice extreme social distancing and shouldn't get out, um, let us know. Uh, we, we can certainly do what we can to help to try to provide groceries and just, you know, uh, help folks. We, we, we want to make sure that we're available to the community. Um, you don't have to be a member of Southside Baptist Church. Uh, if, if you know a neighbor who's in that condition, uh, you can certainly help them yourself. If you're part of one of our small groups, you can mobilize your small group to try to help. Again, the fewer people I think that are involved in that, probably I'm guessing the better. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we want to be available to help. So let us know. Uh, we have been, um, again, trying to get everybody to say communicate back with us, use our social media feeds, email, phone number, you call the church office, uh, and we'll definitely try to do what we can to help. Um, Meredith asks if there's any idea how long we might be experiencing the social distancing, school closures, etc. cetera. Uh, how long do I need to mentally prepare myself for being at home with my three-year-old? <laughs> Um, <laughs> and we're going through the same thing at my house. So, uh, keeping three kids busy is, uh, is, t is tiring when there's no school. Well, and by um, the way, next week on our Wednesday night live event, we're going to talk uh, about that, about what you can do with your kids and how you can talk to your kids about this. And, yeah. uh, uh, Todd Canarins and, uh, Dallas Barfield are going to be with us to give some ideas for how to help your kids with this new online school reality too. So, Next Wednesday night at 7 p.m., join us for that. It's going to be going to be a great discussion. So anyway. I'll definitely back, be tuning tune yeah. into that one. <laughs> so back to the question, though, Meredith's question. How long do you think we might expect this sort of new reality? Um, I think, you know, I'm giving a guess when I say this because we haven't gone through this recently, but I think probably an eight-week uh, period is probably what we're looking at uh, to start. I'm not saying anything about schools because I don't know what schools right. will do. Um, you know, so I, I would say it's probably going to be at least an eight week period till we see this thing, thing sort of turn over and also see what kind of true impact it's going to have on our city um, as well. Because, uh, you know, once you start to see community spread, like not just travel related cases, but you see spread within the community, then we know it's going to be pretty high volume and that's going to mean it's going to last for a while. So when do you expect, I mean, things are al already becoming pretty serious, but you know, it's a little surreal because we're in Florida, you know, Jacksonville, we're used to hurricanes and, and it's, you go outside and it looks doom and gloom or it's coming and you know, it's coming. This it's gone. Yeah. It's gone. And this yeah. is, it's, it's beautiful and sunny and it doesn't seem to come. It, it doesn't seem to leave. I, I guess, I guess my point is with that, like you, you, when do you expect it to get, um, to the, to the worst point? When, when would you expect the peak to come, you said maybe eight weeks until the social distancing. So would that be in another two to three weeks that we might be at its at its height? Yeah, I think I don't know if that's going to be its height, but I think we're going to have a pretty solid signal in about two three weeks okay. of what the effect on the city is going to look like. Now, how long that's going to last is, is really anybody's guess. Um, I will say I, I mentioned this before: pray for warm weather. This type of virus does not like warm weather. That's kind of why the flu is seasonal. Same sort of thing. It does not like heat. So, uh, you know, I, I like the weather right now, but if it gets rid of the virus, I'll take 95 degrees and 100% humidity tomorrow. <laughs> but hey, that's, a, that's an easy thing to pray for. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, that's so yeah, definitely good. Um, all right. We got I think we have some other things here. I have a question about self quarantine or self isolation for 14 days after those 14 days. If you then resume more normal interaction. Um, wouldn't you have to re-isolate after your next exposure with other people? It just doesn't seem to make sense to isolate for 14 days and then go back to normal life. 
Yeah, so I, the self-quarantine for 14 days is for people who've had high-risk travel or exposures, okay. right? Those are the people where you traveled and you went somewhere where it's now endemic, and you come back, and they are, do not want those people interacting in a public environment until they know they don't have it. And so that's what the 14 days comes from. Um, when it comes down to what we're doing right now, which is all practicing social distancing, um, that is not the same thing. That really means that for now, everyone is keeping themselves apart from other people to prevent community spread. So that's kind of a different thing. There is no time on that. Okay. You know, that's really going to be dictated by the Department of Health, the government, their CDC. Everyone's going to be looking at that going forward as to when this thing starts to peak and come down. Um, and so that's that's what that is. It's a, it's a different sort of thing. Okay. All right. So so the self quarantine. Uh, if you've been exposed, if you know you've been exposed. You, you've traveled to one of those places. What about folks who for spring break went to Disney World? Ooh, great question. So, um, you know, I'd consider that to be a pretty high-risk exposure. You would. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say high-risk, but it's an exposure. Okay. Um, and uh, anecdotally, I know of a couple potential cases that came out of trips like that. Um, so – I wouldn't say I, – I would say it's probably a good idea, even though we're already doing social distancing, but it's probably a pretty good idea to, to try it for 14 days and, and just make sure just you're not developing safe. anything. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'm not going to be like, you know, be a hard line on that. For but sure. that would be, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Mary says, Dr. Manuel said on TV that he expects this to peak and flatten and then come back full force. Have you heard anything about that? And then a question like it, uh, Jessica says, do you – do we know if this is something that's going to come back around every year? Yeah, so I think um, if there's a lull in the summertime, which we'll hope for, there may be a resurgence in the fall. So as things start to cool down again, we may start to see it again. Um, and that's because as a pandemic, it really is going – everyone is at some point going to get exposure, most likely. Um, but the question is, in the fall, are we going to have an immunization or some or a vaccine for it, you know, and so it's possible. Uh, I do, I do doubt, and I really this isn't based on anything other than just my opinion. Uh, I do doubt that it's going to go away completely. Okay. I think we'll still see some cases, and I think we will see it potentially come back in the fall. But I'm hoping that gives us enough time for uh, a vaccine or something to come around. And they are looking at treatments. They're looking at things like uh, passive immunity, which means. Say you get the virus, your body protects you against it, you get through it, we take your antibodies and we give it to somebody else who gets it, and then that person gets better faster. Uh, you see that in things like Outbreak, you know, in the movie Outbreak, you know, they give people antibodies. So they're trying things like that. So I'm hoping that with that amount of time, we can figure something out. Okay. All right. Good. Um, let's see. If you have the virus, will you ever get it again? Um, or is it like so, pox? You know, you... so generally you're immunized, okay. you know, now that, that said, you know, the virus, there, there is some talk that there is a couple forms of the virus that it's mutated a couple times. And that's the reason we're seeing different, differing mortalities from what they saw in China. Um, so if it mutates, there's nothing you can do about it, but I would say that once you're exposed, you're pretty good. Okay. Once you're exposed, you're pretty good. Um, you should be safe for a while. All right. What, what, it, that brings up another question. So, so you said it's going to be around. People are going to continue to be exposed. So even after we go back to, I guess it will be a new normal when this is all over, what precautions should people continue to take once they sort of lift the moratorium on going to church and going to restaurants and all those kind of things? Yeah, I mean, I think common sense, you know, you know, we should all be washing our hands and when we covering our cough, covering our sneeze, when we blow our nose, use hand, you know, disinfectant and uh, hand sanitizer. So I think continuing to do those um, common practices that are just common sense. Uh, I think that's what I would say. Okay. Um, I think, I think if we can get a some sort of uh, vaccine or something like that, that'll really make everything, um, you know, potentially go back to, to normal quicker. All right. Uh, do we have any, any final questions that uh, might come in? And again, thank everybody for joining our conversation today with Dr. Fahim Gurgis. 
uh, again, at Southside, we are going to do everything we can to serve our community um, and to, uh, to also make information available as we can and just to stay connected in community through some new means and sources. So if you've got any other questions, send those in. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Fahim, for taking the time. I know you are right now especially incredibly busy, and so we want to uh, thank you for that. A couple other questions. Um, what about test sites? Um, do you, I know. I think I heard that uh, the the field, the, the the parking lot over by the Jaguar Stadium is going to be a test site, or is yeah. It test actually, I have to get caught up on that. Okay. I know that they're going to be starting community testing. Um, I think Walmart's going to be doing something like that. From what I was reading, I, I may be I may be wrong. But the so. last I heard, you don't just show up like you. Have okay, to. yeah. So I, one thing I will say pretty clearly is don't show up to your doctor's office wanting a test. Don't walk into the emergency department wanting a test um, it, you know I think if you don't have symptoms or even if you do um, but you're doing okay at home uh, I don't really think there's any real reason to run out trying to find out if you have it or not um, so I, I think but if they start to offer that in community settings like in big parking lots where you can go get that test and there's probably some designated rules for who gets testing okay. then then that's probably reasonable um, but I definitely think if you want to see your doctor about this, call them in advance and ask them what you should do. Um, and if you want to go to, even if you want to go to an emergency department and you're not really sick, like to the level where you're calling 911, um, give them a call ahead to tell them what you think you have so that they can meet you at the door and make sure you have the protective stuff going That's on. good advice. Um, Elizabeth, who I know has preschoolers and uh, kids at home with her, <laughs> what about going to the playgrounds with children? Bad idea? Playgrounds are closed, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I oh, know. Oh, the parks. Yeah, parks, yeah. Sorry, parks are closed. I guess um, playgrounds at schools, I don't know. You know, I, I think it's okay. I actually think that's not a very high risk You don't. You, so you, you would uh, take your kids to a, to a playground or let them play outside? Yeah, I think as long as there's not a, a high density of people around. Okay. I mean, if the, the playground is crawling with other kids, then, then yeah, I might check it, pick a different one, you know. But I think um, being outside, definitely – lowers the chance for you to be exposed. Remember, it's kind of in closed paces, places. If it's, a, if it's a playground with one or two other kids, I think you're all right. Okay. That's what I would say. All right. Yeah, I would, it's a long time. Eight weeks would be a long time to keep your preschooler in the house. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm experiencing that right now. So, <laughs> I mean, uh, at some point, there, <laughs> seriously, there, there is a balance between sort of your mental health and uh, you've got you've to keep yourself mentally, emotionally, spiritually healthy along with physically. And to, to be isolated that long has other side effects, yeah. um, and social distancing has other emotional side effects as well. So I, I think sure. what you said earlier about being reasonable is really important. Yeah, and I think going out is, going outside is not, you know, it's not the same thing as, I mean, you know, the whole idea of social distancing and self-quarantine doesn't mean you can't go outside right. and play and ride your bike and go in the backyard or whatever it is that you want to do outside. That's fine. Um, it's just being clo in closed spaces. With other people. Yeah. Um, uh, Scott wants to know if vitamins or other meds will help hold off the virus. Does it do anything to build your immunity and keep you? Yeah, not that I know of. Okay. All not right. that I know of. I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking vitamins. I think it's great. But uh, uh, Peggy, uh, well, actually Miles, she says this question is for Miles, <laughs> wants to know what the run on toilet paper is all about. I have no idea. So if you guys figure it out, <laughs> let me know. I've been trying to figure that out myself. I was like, and actually, I took a picture with Raina and I at Publix with like no toilet paper. We, we were we were chuckling. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't I, get it. Maybe that's one of the things we as a church can do is is pool toilet paper. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm serious. So it's so ironic because. Two weeks before, we had a sermon illustration, and I put two squares of toilet paper in everybody's worship guide, and I used four rolls of toilet paper from my house for that sermon illustration. <laughs> Are you regretting it now? <laughs> and now I'm thinking, I'm probably going to need those four rolls of toilet paper. Yeah, you could have sold them on eBay. <laughs> Could have made could have made a lot of money. Um, um, so I, I think there was there might have been a question earlier that I missed, and now I can't get to it. So. I'm good. Okay, I'm good there. Is there a risk involved in still meeting with friends but keeping at least six to ten feet apart, or is isolation the way to go? So, I mean, if you wanted to have, if you wanted to have friends over for dinner, uh, yeah. I mean, is that is that a good idea? Not a good idea? I think right now it's not a great idea. Okay, I was going to say, don't take this wrong, but I'm probably not going to invite you and Chandra over for dinner. Right yeah, now. <laughs> you don't you don't want me over after I go back to the ER. I I think um, I think just. Just lay low for a little bit. Okay. Uh, I mean, gosh, it, it's not f fun to be in this, but I think we also have to be just careful. 
and um, everybody's having different interactions in their day to day lives, and you don't know what's going to get brought to a dinner party, sure. you know, and you may not even know, you know, so, and that's how these things get spread. So I would be careful. Okay. That's a good word. Can I say one thing really Please. quick? I just want everybody to know, I think I kind of just have to say this. Everything I'm saying right now is just based on my reading, my experience. It's my personal opinion. So it has nothing to do with where I work. I just wanted to let everybody know that. Yeah, well, we appreciate you so much. And I know for so many people at Southside, part of the reason this was really important for us to do is, I don't know if you're like, if you're like me, you are hearing sometimes contradictory messages from news outlets. Uh, one channel will say one thing, another channel will say another thing. And uh, even for all the same channel, you might hear conflicting things. And uh, it's hard to know who to trust. And of course, it's an emerging situation. It's a new thing. So people, there's it's fast developing. Uh, but we just felt like it was important. Uh, Fahim is somebody a lot of us know and trust. A lot of you have sought him out for medical advice and opinions before seeing him around church. So we thought a trusted face would be somebody that would give us all some good um, good input. So I just wanted to, to throw that out. Also, along that line of social distancing and, um, you know, one of our big challenges as a church and just keeping connected in community is this this sort of runs against everything we do as a church. I mean, it's right. completely counter. Yeah. So we are looking at ways that we can maintain community during this crisis. And one of the things that we are doing is uh, we're working with our deacons as small group leaders to facilitate uh, small group meetings via Zoom. So hopefully if you're in a small group already, hopefully your small group leader is going to reach out and is going to, um, is going to, going to talk to you about scheduling a time for a Zoom conference, and you guys can get together, just do a, do a well check, how's everybody doing, you know, uh, just to, what are you, what are you doing with your kids, this is what I'm doing with my kids, hey, I found this great resource online, those kind of things will help, uh, but also for pray, uh, for praying together, uh, meeting each other's needs, uh, also for possible Bible study, as, as you can just actually have your Bible study, we'll be making the, uh, the, the small group discussion questions available um, just like normal, and your small group can meet and discuss those questions just like normal. So be looking for information about that. I also wanted to let you know that we are looking forward to worshiping on Sunday. It'll be a little different than normal, um, but we are going to be worshiping. Uh, we'll be uh, at 9 o'clock and at 1030, um, and then, of course, those services will be online and available if you couldn't even join us um, at, at the go live time, you can join us after the fact. So we want you to join us for worship. We're going to finish up our Losing My Religion series this coming Sunday, uh, the 22nd at 9 and at 1030. So you can do that uh, via Facebook. Uh, I think YouTube is going to be another way you can do that, right? We want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, like us on Facebook, uh, share everything you see, share this video because some of your friends are, are going to maybe benefit from it. Um, Meredith already said that the video has given me so much peace of mind and I feel um, a lot more informed. So uh, thanks for that word, Meredith, and thanks for joining us. Um, again, just make sure you join us Sunday night. Uh, thank you guys for being a part of it. Make sure you join our Facebook group as well. Uh, we not just like our Facebook page, but join our Facebook group to stay connected. We'll be posting on Facebook Live and YouTube more. So make sure you join in and subscribe on those two uh, venues as well. Um, lots of resources coming. Sunday night, we're going to do kind of a Q&A talkback session on the Losing My Religion series. And then a week from Sunday on the 29th, we're going to launch a brand new series, again, all online, called Pause. Yes. And we're going to talk P-A-U-S-E, not P-A-W-S. But So pause as in press the pause button, because that's really kind of what God's done to all of us. So yeah. we're, we're going yeah, to talk a, about what that means. That's a good one. That's, that's yeah, cool. just uh, what do you do with all this extra time and, uh, and stillness? So we're looking forward to that. Um, uh, somebody's asking, how do you join the Facebook group? Um, I don't know. I, I think you... <laughs> I don't know the secret code. You have to know the secret handshake, I think. But we'll, we'll get you that information so you can all do that. Again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, Fahim, any last words? Anything else you want our, our folks to know? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the thing that kind of separates us from the world, right, is just, you know, our faith, right? So knowing that we have God and we have um, him to get us through this is going to be the, the thing that kind of gets us through, I think, day to day. And also, I just want to thank my wife, Chandra, for taking care of the kids at home right now, because I know uh, that can be frustrating. So I'm excited to hear next week's uh, message well, so, as well. Good. Well, we want to help. And again, thank you for all you doing. And, and I can't, you know, I thank you for that last comment, too, because it's so true. Guys, God is in control. He's got a plan. 
uh, and he's going to do something. He's going to make beauty out of ashes. So we are praying for you. Please keep in touch. Let us know how we can serve you, what we can do for you, how we can minister to you. And I'm just going to say, as we close this out, let's all pray together. So we've got uh, 57 people right now joining us. So if you would all join me, we're going to pray together right now. I'm going to pray specifically for uh, Dr. Gerges and all of our uh, first responders, medical workers, and uh, and also for all of you and your friends and family. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you right now that you are um, you are in control. And uh, Lord, in the midst of chaos and pan uh, panic and anxiety and worry, uh, Lord, we see and know that your hand is at work. Uh, we thank you that you are uh, putting people in positions who can serve and care and minister to the needs of others. Uh, as they serve as your hands and feet, I think specifically right now of uh, the Gerges family and all of our medical professionals, our doctors, nurses, uh, first responders. Lord, I just pray that you would protect them and strengthen them as they serve this city and our cities around the world in, in your name. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, more than just hands that bring healing, I pray that you would give them uh, a peace that passes understanding. I pray that you give them the words of comfort that they will need to share and that they might be lights in a very dark and troubled place. Lord, may that be true for your church. Lord, we pray for this church and all churches as we adjust to this normal. Help us to know how we can serve in your name. Help us to know how we can keep people connected. And Father, thank you for the members of Southside and those who uh, are a part of this community. Uh, Lord, in the way they're already stepping up and serving their neighbors, God, um, may we look back on this season and see uh, the wonderful, awesome things that you've done. And Lord, may, may we be part of the people who are stepping in the gap for our community, our city, um, to serve and to minister at this difficult time. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all the love you show us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, don't forget, join us Sunday morning at 9 and 1030. And next Wednesday night, we'll be talking more about what you can do with your kids uh, while they are out on Corona break. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that was good.